Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Hi there, welcome to another Cold War History video. Today we're going to examine a myth from the collapse of the Soviet Union that refuses to die. A myth that the legacy media continued to report as if it were a fact, and politicians casually repeat even to this day. That myth, or conspiracy theory, call it what you want, is that during the collapse of the USSR between 1991 and 1992, over 100 suitcase or backpack sized nuclear weapons went missing from the Soviet infantry and were sold to terrorists by the Russian Mafia. And to prove my point about how pervasive this myth still is, here is Republican Congressman Pat Fallon speaking on Fox recently. Um, but, you know, the, the other thing, Stuart, that's a little bit, um, you know, it concerns me is there was a report years ago that the Russia has lost control of accounting of 100 suitcase nuclear weapons. That's according to their former national security advisor. So it, it's a it's of grave concern. It always has been. But Ill-informed politicians repeating things they've read on social media. Here's one thing. But when a myth is weaponized, no pun intended, to shape a narrative or leverage public or governmental actions, it becomes much more sinister. In mid-2023, Ukrainian Army Head of Intelligence, Lieutenant General Kirillo Budanov, created a story in the international media that Russian rebel Wagner Group mercenaries were intending to capture the Russian Vrenesh 45 National Nuclear Weapons Storage Facility and then to threaten the West. Of course, in doing so, he invoked the backpack suitcase weapon myth. <laughs> Окрім звичайних ядерних зарядів, там знаходились і знаходяться. В радянські часи це називали рюкзаки. Рюкзаки, да. Підрозділи рюкзачників, так звані. Це така народна назва. Це надмалі ядерні заряди, які переносились в рюкзаках портативні. Це одне з головних їх сховищ. Це ще одна з причин, чому вони пішли саме туди. I tell the whole Voronish 45 story in another video, and it's a good video. You should check it out, link in the top right corner. But suffice it to say that nothing Budanov said in that press conference was true. However, the legacy media repeated it to the Western world as if it was completely factual. And there lies the crux of the issue. The governments and their legacy mainstream media manipulate the public through fear. This was at its most blatant in the false narrative leading to the 2003 Iraq invasion, when, certainly in the UK, we were told that Iraq had nuclear and chemical weapons that could be used to strike us in 45 minutes, something we now know was completely fabricated. The story of the missing Soviet nuclear backpack suitcase bombs is one that was created entirely by politicians to leverage fear. And we'll meet this gentleman and his attaché case of doom later in the video. But spoiler alert, this myth has already been completely debunked at every governmental level and also reported as such in the media. So why then does it keep getting repeated? Because scary stories are always more attractive to the public than the boring old truth. So it's my aim in this video to forensically examine the myth and get to its truth. Also, to arrive at the origin of the conspiracy theory. In part one, we're going to look at Cold War nuclear weapons technology to see if such backpack suitcase weapons were ever made or if they're even possible. Firstly, I'm going to ask you to examine your understanding of what you consider a backpack or a suitcase is. Because when I start talking about dimensions and weights of warheads, you need to understand whether you could fit one into such a piece of luggage. So let's take a look firstly at backpacks. 
This is what most people consider to be a medium to large backpack. What weight do you think you could comfortably carry around walking around, say, the streets of a city such as London or New York? Probably if you're male, 40 to 50 pounds, 25 to 30 kilograms. And for our average suitcase, let's consider the average check-in bag for an airline. 1.2 metres by half a metre in dimensions. And I think this girl could probably drag 25 to 30 kilograms quite easily around an airport concourse. Please do remember these parameters because I'm going to regularly ask you throughout the video, do you consider that this warhead with this weight could fit into an average backpack or suitcase? Having examined luggage, let's look at nuclear weapons. Mankind's first nuclear explosion was a Trinity test in New Mexico on the 16th of July 1945. The explosive power of this explosion, or yield as it is known, was 25 kilotons. By modern standards, 25 kilotons is a quite small atomic explosion. And this was caused by the first A-bomb, known as the gadget, pictured here. About two metres in diameter, it weighed several tonnes. Within weeks of the Trinity test, American atomic bombs were dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, effectively removing both cities from the face of the earth and ending World War II, but at the cost of over half a million Japanese lives. And this is me at the Hiroshima Peace Park and World Heritage Site a few years ago. The park exists to remind mankind never again to deploy nuclear weapons in anger. And, to be fair, mankind hasn't since the Nagasaki bombing. Although we have come close a few times. But almost immediately after the end of World War II began the Cold War with our former World War II ally, the Soviet Union. The Cold War lasting until 1991, which is quite recent in modern historical terms. Accompanying the Cold War, of course, was the nuclear arms race, where NATO and the Warsaw Pact competed with each other to create as many powerful and deployable nuclear weapons as possible. The first strategic weapons were freefall hydrogen bombs, with the yield now in the megaton range. A megaton is a million tonnes of TNT equivalent. But these freefall bombs were literally the size of a minivan and weighed over 10 tonnes. Here's a human for comparison. Between the mid-1950s and mid-1960s, as well as making nuclear weapons more powerful and placing them in the mid-megaton range, nuclear scientists in both East and West sought to miniaturise the weapons from the huge 10-ton freefall bombs into warheads that could be deployed by strategic missile, either land-launched or submarine-launched. By the mid-1980s, strategic nuclear weapons now look like this. The dark, conical-shaped items are US Minuteman MIRV warheads. Each warhead is a megaton in yield. MIRV standing for Multiple Independently Targeted Reentry Vehicle. In the same time scale, the USSR had the same nuclear technology. And for scale, here is Arnold Schwarzenegger, you might know him, next to a mock-up of a Soviet MIRV warhead constructed for the 1993 movie True Lies. MIRV warheads, both eastern and western, weighed between 300 and 500 kilograms and were about the same height as an average man. I think we can safely say that strategic weapons of the Cold War would not fit into a suitcase or a backpack, and they weighed so much that even a man of Arnie's strength could not move one on his own. Although strategic weapons made up 80% of their nuclear weapons inventory during the Cold War, there was another class of smaller nuclear weapon, the tactical nuclear weapon. Tactical nuclear weapons were designed and intended for use on specific battlefields, such as the Central European Theatre of Operations. They were so designed for short-range use, and because of this, were smaller in size and warhead yield. Initially, tactical nuclear weapons were only deployed by rocket artillery, such as this East German Army operated Soviet Lunar M rocket system. Known by NATO as a Frog 7, it has a maximum range of 40 miles and a 2 kiloton warhead.
a major driving force behind warhead militarization technology in both the USSR and NATO, was the operational requirement to be able to deploy tactical nuclear artillery. The first nuclear artillery shell was tested in 1952. It was 280 millimeters in diameter and weighed 400 kilograms. This is footage of the Grable test in 1953, which was the live testing and firing of a nuclear artillery shell. Initially, nuclear artillery systems were very large and cumbersome, but by 1982, the size of US nuclear artillery shells had reduced in size to 155mm diameter by 1m in length, and each shell weighed about 70 kilograms. With the technology now to develop fairly small warheads, by the late 1950s, early 60s, the US designed the M28 David Crockett, a short-range nuclear launch projector. The David Crockett was introduced so that infantry battle groups had access to nuclear weapons for offensive and defensive purposes. The weapon was as ludicrous and as dangerous as it looks. It was effectively a crew-served recoilless gun that could lob an M388 nuclear projectile about 4 kilometres. The Davy Crockett's M388 projectile was based on the new Whiskey 54 warhead, which was the smallest and still is the smallest nuclear warhead ever made. It had a yield of 0.2 kilotons for the M28 version or 2 kilotons for the M29 version. The USA manufactured about 500 M388 projectiles. The USSR did not have an equivalent. The Davy Crockett system was introduced operationally between 1960 and 1970, but thankfully by 1971 the whole system had been scrapped. But before its deployment, its tactics were tested with US troops in a Desert Rock series of tests in Nevada. These unbelievable scenes are only about 60 or so years old. The white grainy appearance of the film is caused by ionising radiation. With great power, comes great responsibility and I think now is a good time to introduce the concept of permissive action links or nuclear use controls. The scenario of the 1963 Cold War based black comedy Dr Strangelove saw an unhinged US Army Air Force colonel intent on starting World War III by launching unauthorised nuclear weapons against the USSR. Of course by 1968 such a scenario was impossible because the United States had introduced permissive action links to all its nuclear weapons stockpile and systems. In short, a PL is a cryptographic code which is required to unlock and arm a nuclear weapon. Without the correct PAL code, the nuclear weapon is completely useless. PAL systems vary widely between different equipments, but for example, this is a mid-1980s Minuteman missile PAL in action. There was a rumour doing the rounds a few years ago, which has been completely debunked, that all permissive action links in the United States were set to 12 or 7 zeros. You know, the default setting for anybody's password. Unfortunately, that simply wasn't true. In 1971, in order to make the world a safer place from unintended or unauthorised nuclear detonations, the United States shared its permissive action link technology with all the declared nuclear powers. France, China and the Soviet Union all recognised the benefits 
of having a control system such as PAL and began to adopt it across their entire nuclear deployment systems, although the implementation engineering took a couple of decades. But by 1989, almost all the world's nuclear stockpile were protected by PAL links, with the exception of the UK that has never used PAL codes. For more modern, smaller nuclear weapons, such as tactical missile warheads or newer build nuclear artillery shells, there was no manual code to enter. You need a custodian to connect a PAL encoder decoder with the correct key variable to the warhead to activate or deactivate the system. This is a United States T1534 PAL encoder and decoder. And from the other side of the Iron Curtain, this is a Soviet 55TM PAL decoder and encoder. A huge point to take away from all of this is that if you have a nuclear weapon without the correct PAL code, it is completely useless to you. So far, all the nuclear weapons we've looked at in this video have needed a launch system to be initiated, either a missile or an artillery gun. None can be initiated by the operator alone. But there is a class of nuclear weapon that can be the nuclear mine or atomic demolition munition. In the late 1950s, the US decided it had a capability gap where it needed to equip its combat engineers with a nuclear weapon designed principally for reserve bridge demolitions, but also for the destruction of infrastructure such as runways that they would be forced to abandon, area denial by cratering, and also a method of ambushing enemy formations as they move through choke points such as valleys. So therefore, the atomic demolition munition was born. The first iteration was an experimental weapon known as the T2, Project B, which was a 20 kiloton warhead on the back of a trailer. The T2 was never deployed operationally because very quickly it transitioned into what became the Whiskey 30 Tactical Atomic Demolition Munition, which was a tenth of the weight, about 400 kilograms, and a quarter of the size of the T2. The Whiskey 30 was much lighter and manoeuvrable compared to the T2, although it was a much smaller warhead, coming in at 0.5 kilotons. At a weight of about 400 kilograms, it was easily manoeuvred by a squad of combat engineers, but would still need craning on and off a transport vehicle. Designed in the late 1950s, the Whiskey 30 was tested in the Nevada test site to demonstrate its cratering abilities. If you're ever lucky enough to visit the Nevada test site, even today you'll find this crater still in place, measuring 400 metres in diameter by 100 metres in depth. Whilst the tactical atomic demolition munition did its job, it was still considered cumbersome and not as deployable and rugged as it needed to be. So therefore, in 1960-61, the Americans designed the medium atomic demolition munition, a much more compact and ironically more powerful demolition munition that was also completely waterproof and submersible, which lended itself to a secondary role as a sea mine. In the land role, the medium atomic demolition munition was now almost man portable. The main warhead assembly coming in at about 170 kilograms, so not quite a one man lift, a two man lift, and a push. The other parts of the weapon system were modular and could be carried by other members of the team on foot. So, in all, it would take a team of between six and eight to deploy this weapon. The medium atomic demolition munition was also fitted with an analog electronic permissive action link and the operator needed to set a code on a rotary dial arming switch. The weapon could be initiated either by a timer, a command wire from a distance or more commonly by an encrypted radio link. The weapon was particularly effective for amphibious forces for mining harbours and sea lanes and this is the result. In the first seconds of the blast, all the warships have been completely destroyed. And although that white cloud does look pretty, it is actually superheated steam that even two to three miles away from the detonation will scold you to death within seconds. 
And that's not your only worry. The steam is highly radioactive and uh, pumping out about 1 to 4 sieverts an hour of ionising radiation. A bit of Cold War trivia and a true story is that when the Channel Tunnel between England and France was being proposed in the early 1980s, the government of the day considered deploying an atomic demolition munition in the final build to destroy the tunnel in the event of war to prevent the Soviet army using it to invade the United Kingdom. Obviously, the idea never got off the ground. The medium atomic demolition munition was actually a really good weapon system. Well thought out, well designed, and it stayed in service because of that until 1990, at the end of the Cold War, and it was destroyed with all other tactical nuclear weapons, as ordered by George Bush Sr. under the Presidential National Initiative. It did have its faults. It wasn't quite man-portable. It was a squad-level weapon, coming in a couple of hundred kilograms. But on the plus side, it had a dual permissive action link system, so even if it did fall into the hands of terrorists, it could not be used, and that's an important point to make. As you can see in this image, a classroom of army engineers are trading on a medium atomic demolition munition, and it is not quite man-portable yet, which brought about the next version of the device, the Whiskey 54 Special Atomic Demolition Munition. Now, the Whiskey 54 was indeed small enough to be man-portable, just about. It weighed 58 kilograms and could be carried by one man. The weapon used the same physics package as the M388 Davy Crockett nuclear round. I'll tell you what, I'll let Sandia National Labs explain the system in this historical clip. The B-54 bomb is 18 inches long, 12 inches in diameter, and weighs approximately 58 pounds. It is produced in two different yields. External parts of the bomb consist of a front case section, rear case section, and a lock-secured cover. Removal of the lock secured cover permits access to the fusing and firing components. The timer is settable in five minute increments over a range of five minutes to 12 hours on a Mod 1 bomb or 24 hours on a Mod 2. The time setting in hours and minutes appears in readout windows. The timer is started by turning the arm safe control to arm. This disengages the time setting knob. The timer may be stopped by depressing the arm safe control or by turning the safety screw. The following components consist of an electric detonator, a photo electric transducer, and the plane wave explosive generator. The plane wave explosive generator contains a shaped explosive charge, which must be installed in the arm well if the bomb is to be capable of operating. It is normally stored in the safe well. The bomb is armed by setting the desired time delay inserting the plane wave explosive generator in the arm well and turning the arm safe control to the arm position. The Whiskey 54 Special Atomic Demolition Munition was designed specifically for US Special Forces, so-called, during the Cold War, green light teams. Maybe for that reason, it had no permissive action link safety. Just a manual rotary code lock that could actually be defeated with a crowbar and a bit of force. This made this weapon very dangerous. If you lost control of a Whiskey 54 and its plane wave generated charge, anybody could detonate it. But the Whiskey 54 was man portable and could be carried by a single man, possibly a woman, but it's still quite heavy. It came with this associated backpack. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, the Backpack Nuclear Weapon of Legend. And this is how it potentially would look in the hands of a terrorist. Not exactly inconspicuous, 
and nothing like the backpack we defined at the beginning of the video. The Whiskey 54 was the smallest nuclear weapon ever created. So if a terrorist wanted to fit it into a suitcase, how would that look? Well again, fairly enormous and not at all airport check-in friendly. The Whiskey 54 had a yield of between 1 and 2 kilotons. So what damage could a terrorist with a Whiskey 54 in a suitcase or backpack actually do? Well for that we have a real world comparison. The Beirut explosion of the 4th of August 2020. In this incident, a warehouse by the Beirut docks containing 2,000 tonnes of ammonium nitrate, 2 kilotons, caught fire and then detonated. I need to point out that nuclear and conventional explosions are not directly comparable, but for blast damage alone, the result would be similar. If this was a nuclear explosion, the Beirut harbour area would be irradiated and would be lethal to approach for about 30 days after the explosion. So surely this then is the smoking gun. Backpack nuclear weapons are not a myth after all. Well, the devil's in the detail. This video is about Soviet or Russian backpack nuclear weapons, not American. And whilst the Whiskey 54 did exist, and therefore we know the technology is feasible, in 1984, the Whiskey 54 system was decommissioned. All devices are accounted for and have been destroyed. And since 1991, the United States does not possess any tactical nuclear weapons. Therefore, using what we learned from the American stockpile, we are obviously looking for the Soviet equivalent of the US Whiskey 54 Special Atomic Demolition Munition. It may surprise many people to learn that the Soviet nuclear inventory is not as secret as you might think. Thanks mainly to Cold War espionage, and then since the collapse of the Soviet Union, from 1990 to the early 2000s, arms control declarations and international inspections, we know more or less all weapon types, designations and quantities that were held by the Soviet Union that are now in the custody of the Russian Federation. And thanks to late 1980s Soviet glasnost and then the desire for arms control by the Yeltsin administration of the Russian Federation in the 1990s, much of the details of the former Soviet stockpile are in the public domain. Key facts to take away from this data is that we know that the Soviets did not go in for nuclear weapons miniaturization of warheads in the same way the Americans did. Firstly, they struggled with the technology, making big nuclear weapons, it's fairly easy, so to speak. The smaller the warhead, the more technical and precision the engineering. Also, doctrinally, the Soviets went for higher yield weapons because they lacked the precision targeting that NATO weapon systems did. And therefore, they needed a larger yield to ensure destruction of the target. We also know that this is the smallest nuclear weapon produced by the USSR. This is the 3BV3 nuclear artillery round. And uh, look at the legs of the spectators for scale. So then let's cut to the chase. Did the USSR develop atomic demolition munitions? Well, yes, but they were known as atomic or nuclear mines. ADMs were purely an American term. They are listed in the Soviet inventory by modification. But by modification, we probably mean by generation. Mod 1 and 2, or let's call it Generation 1 and 2 of uh, the Soviet nuclear mine, would almost certainly resemble the US tactical demolition munition. Unfortunately, there are no public domain photographs of this device, so I've put up a US tactical demolition munition photograph for scale. But I would imagine Generation 1 is probably the size of two oil barrels, and Generation 2 probably the size of an oversized or large signal oil barrel. Soviet Modification 3 nuclear mine, or Generation 3, will date from the early 1970s. Again, possibly intentionally, this closely resembles the US medium atomic demolition munition, and they had the same role, particularly as a nuclear sea mine. 
Now, on X.com, I've located this image. Somebody is claiming to be a Soviet Generation 3 nuclear mine. I'm not quite convinced, but the design and engineering are feasible. And also, it's painted in the correct colour scheme, similar to the artillery rounds. So maybe it is a genuine article. Whether this photo is an imposter or not, the Soviet Mod 3 nuclear mine dimensions are correct. We know that. And it's directly comparable to the US medium atomic demolition munition. And like its US equivalent, this device weighs over 150 kilograms. It is therefore not man portable. So where is the Soviet special atomic demolition munition equivalent? Well, in short, there isn't one. The Soviets did not create a warhead small enough, such as the US Whiskey 54, to make such a device. They sensibly did not create a Davy Crockett launcher equivalent. They saw no need to create such a tidy nuclear device to destroy something that a Frog 7 or Scud B missile could do perfectly well. So the closest equivalent we have is this Generation 3 nuclear mine, which I think we can all agree is not fitting in anybody's backpack or suitcase anytime soon. Nor could the average man carry one on his back weighing 150 kilograms. And that's it. In short, the Soviets did not have a device small enough to be classed as a backpack or suitcase nuclear ball. End of story. So where does Senator Kurt Weldon get his attaché case of doom from? Well, be prepared to go down the murky political rabbit hole of what became known as the 1997 Lebed hoax. And this is where the conspiracy theory starts. To start this murky political story off, let me introduce this gentleman, Alexander Ivanovich Lebed. Born in 1950 in Rostov in the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic of the USSR, for most of his life he was a career soldier and an officer in the Soviet Army, retiring as Lieutenant General in 1995 after the collapse of the USSR. Because he was a sort of folk hero with his background, he entered politics in 1995 and was immediately elected to the state parliament, the Duma. Губернатор Лебедь, безусловно, обладал хорошим чувством юмора, эмоциональностью и, да, потрясающей харизмой. А то, как на него смотрела супруга Инна, вызывало чувство, похожее на зависть. И свое несогласие Лебедь всегда выражал четко и предельно ясно. Like any Russian politician, then and now, Lebed was heavily connected with the oligarchy. Possibly, although never proven, also the higher echelons of Russian organised crime. But to the public, he was considered a political centrist, which was good, honest and with an impeccable military record. In 1996, Lebed ran for president. But he lost out to the popular incumbent, Boris Yeltsin, coming third. Side note and a brag, I met Boris Yeltsin in 1994 in London, two years before that election. But coming third meant he was a man to be reckoned with. So as a consolation prize, and to keep Lebed on board, Yeltsin made him chairman of the Russian Security Council. Alexander Lebed intended to run for president again in the year 2000. Because of this, Yeltsin saw him as a threat, and their relationship very quickly broke down. Lebed was quickly seen as a loose cannon in government, and in October 1996, after rumours that he was plotting a coup against Yeltsin, just three months into his chairmanship of the National Security Council, Yeltsin sacked Lebed. Another thorn in Lebed's political side was the up-and-coming Yeltsin Chief of Staff, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, a fiercely ambitious former KGB officer. Maybe you've heard of him. After Lebed's dismissal, in order to build his power base ready for the 2000 Russian election and take on Yeltsin, Lebed sought to gain the support of the United States, particularly its business and political elite. He met with influential businessman Donald Trump in New York. Calm down, Democrats, this isn't going where you think it's going to go. After meeting with Trump and various politicians in the United States, in reciprocation, in May 1997, Lebed entertained a delegation of US politicians led by Congressman Kurt Weldon. Lebed really wanted US political support and financial investment, so he played fast and loose with his rhetoric. But in private conversation with Kurt Weldon, 
Lebed made a throwaway remark that would blow up in his face. No pun intended. It was May of 97. We sat in Lebed's office and I said, General, tell us about your military. He said, Congressman Weldon, our country's in military's in total disarray. Then he went on and he said, let me give you an example. When I was at Yeltsin's side, he tasked me to account for all of these small atomic demolitions that we had produced. He said, I knew the figure was 132. And he said, we knew that was the number that we had to account for. He said, as Yeltsin's personal advisor, we searched all of our Ministry of Atomic Energy facilities, all of our military bases, all of our strategic forces command. And I could only find uh, something like 50, which meant that there were 80 unaccounted for. If Lebed thought that a slippery politician like Kirk Weldon would keep such a remark in confidence, he was sadly mistaken. Because the professional thing for Weldon to do would have been to quietly pass on Lebed's remarks to the CIA. Instead, Weldon shouted it from the rooftops on his return to the US. As the story started to grow, Lebed could have quite easily played down the remark or denied it. Instead, he doubled down, even increasing the figures. It would prove to be Lebed's political suicide. Lebed repeated his claims in an interview with the CBS News magazine 60 Minutes, broadcast on the 7th of September 1997. Only this time, he said he believed the figure was over a hundred. Lebed said, and I quote, I'm saying that more than a hundred weapons out of the supposed number of 250 are not under the control of the armed forces of Russia. I don't know their location. I don't know whether they've been destroyed or whether they are stored or whether they've been sold or stolen. Without referencing Lebed or calling him a liar, the White House quickly dismissed Lebed's allegations. Based largely on CIA intelligence of the type we've already looked at in the first half of this video. But also the US government had been briefed in depth by the Russian government that Alexander Lebed was simply seeking to discredit Yeltsin's government for his own political ends. James Foley of the US State Department said, and I quote, the government of Russia has assured us that it retains adequate command and control of its nuclear arsenal and that appropriate physical security arrangements exist for these weapons and facilities. We have been assured by the Russian authorities that there is no cause for concern. We believe the assurances we have received." Unquote. If the White House wanted to draw a line with the press under Lebed's remarks, Kurt Weldon simply would not let it lie. Having found his 15 minutes of fame in an otherwise unremarkable political career and seemingly ignoring the briefings of the CIA that Lebed was making up the story to get back at Yeltsin for sacking him, Weldon continued press conferences, which became more and more bizarre. In one of them, he even got an aide to knock up a suitcase bomb by spraying a piece of drainage pipe silver and lighting an attaché case with silver foil to show the press what the Russians had lost. The physics alone of this device were completely illiterate, and as we've seen in the first part of the video, the scale is absolutely nonsense. By now, some of the more sensible elements of the media were suggesting a better use for the tinfoil in this device. The design for Kurt Weldon's nuclear attaché case of doom had not come from Alexander Lebed or any Russian scientific or military source. It had been blatantly plagiarised from a prop made for a British investigative journalism series called The Cook Report in 1993. We're in Red Square and on our way to a secret meeting to buy plutonium to make a nuclear bomb. If the Cook Report can make a nuclear bomb in a briefcase, why can't terrorists do the same? What price would the pure plutonium be? I don't want to digress into the Cook report. We haven't got time. And as well as that, Roger Cook successfully sued a British newspaper who accused him of staging many of his investigations. But I will say, if it wasn't staged, it was incredibly scientifically illiterate and naive, as we've already seen that no nuclear weapon exists that is small enough 
to fit into an attaché case. And as for the notion of buying weapons-grade plutonium on the black market from the Russian mafia, all Cook succeeded in doing in this investigation was buying depleted uranium from a couple of con men. And you can buy depleted uranium on the open market. Think about it. Had that been the real Russian mafia, Cook would have been killed before he left Moscow. By September 1997, the news cycle had started to pick holes in Lebed's account. He clearly had a huge political motive to damage the Kremlin and Yeltsin's government for his own political ends. But also, how could Lebed have conducted a thorough inventory of Russia's nuclear weapons stockpile in just the three months he was in office before Yeltsin sacked him? Also, where were these 100 missing nuclear weapons now? And if they were in the hands of terrorists, why hadn't we seen one yet? It was beginning to look to the media, without corroboration, like Lebed had conducted a hoax. In 1998, for a congressional committee hearing chaired by Kurt Weldon, Lebed produced such corroboration in the form of Alexei Yablokov, a member of the Russian National Security Council when Lebed was chairman. Except Yablokov, who was indeed a respected ecologist and environmentalist, but whose expertise was civil nuclear waste and contamination, not nuclear weapons and military nuclear facilities. Worse still, in his testimony, very quickly he went off script, and instead of corroborating Lebed, muddied the waters with the suggestion that these were not missing armed forces suitcase nuclear weapons, but in fact KGB secret black ops made to order weapons. He further added that they may not have been taken into account in the Soviet general nuclear arsenal and may not be under the control of the Russian Defense Ministry. I met one people who told me several years ago, yes, do, uh, do you know that uh, exists such, su such a small size of nuclear weapons like suitcase? I was surprised and uh, uh, cannot believe. Uh, but he told me, I made it. Such a, such a strange situation. Oh, oh, at, the, at the end of this story, I'm absolutely sure that it, it has been made, but i do not sure that it exists just now. Such a situation. The look on Kurt Weldon's face whilst Yablokov is giving his testimony. It's clear by now. He must know the whole thing is a hoax. Yablokov was almost repeating the plot of the 1981 Frederick Forsyth novel and 1986 Hollywood movie, The Fourth Protocol, in which two KGB officers smuggle a black ops nuclear weapon into the UK to blow up a US Air Force base. Yablokov's testimony was almost immediately ridiculed by the Russian FSB, the successor to the KGB, and the Russian Ministry of Defence 12th Main Directorate, who is responsible for the custody of all nuclear weapons. They stated that the KGB had never had access to nuclear weapons at any time in the Soviet Union's history. And that Yablokov, although a respected ecologist, was simply an old man listening to hearsay and old wives' tales. The final nail in the Lebed hoax came from the testimony of Stanislav Lunev. Lunev, who was a fierce opponent of Boris Yeltsin, had been a colonel in the GRU, who had defected to the United States in 1992 when Yeltsin rose to power. The GRU were the Soviet military intelligence organisation. In attempting to back up Yablokov, Lunev truly jumped the shark with his testimony, claiming that not only were 100 Black Ops nuclear weapons missing, but they had been smuggled into NATO countries ready for war and hidden in secret caches attended to by Russian agents and Russian embassy staff. And I quote, these devices, identified as RA-115s, weigh from 50 to 60 pounds. They can last for many years if wired to an electric source. In case there is a loss of power, there is a battery backup. If the battery runs low, the weapon has a transmitter that sends a coded message, either by satellite or directly to a GRU post at a Russian embassy or consulate, unquote. Whilst it is possible that Stanislav Ludev is describing a Soviet Generation 3 nuclear mine, which indeed does have a battery backup and indeed can have an encrypted radio link, these are not off the books Black Ops weapons. They are in the Russian military inventory. Why would Black Ops weapons have a designation number, for instance? But it is the claim that 100 of them 
are hidden in NATO countries and texting the nearest Russian embassy for a recharge that is just pure fantasy. Lunev was completely ridiculed in the media. And with that, the consensus of opinion turned that Lebed had hoaxed Weldon and the US media. And that was the end of the story. Alexander Lebed's political career was severely damaged by the whole missing nuclear weapons affair. He was investigated in 1998 by the FSB for passing state secrets to the Americans, but he was never indicted. He did not run for president as a result, and in 2000, the election was won by Vladimir Putin. Instead, Lebed became governor of a Russian region. Two years after Putin's election, Lebed was killed in 2002 in a freak helicopter crash. Putin attended his funeral. Well, we're at the end of the video now. Thanks so much for staying with me for what was quite a long video. Hope you enjoyed it, and I do hope you learned something new about the Cold War from my uh, content. There will be those that, despite all the evidence to the contrary, still believe the missing backpack nuclear weapons myth. I think they're probably beyond convincing. But to finalise, I just want to apply Occam's razor. 35 years after these mysterious weapons supposedly have gone missing, we are yet to see one in real life. There are no plans. There are no witnesses. No engineers. And if they are in the hands of terrorists, why haven't they used one yet? So, when the legacy media or politicians raise the spectre of missing Russian or Soviet nuclear weapons, send them a link to this video. The threat of nuclear terrorism does exist. But now, from new enemies and new states with new technologies. Not from chasing ghosts from the Cold War.